good morning once again. And for those who are uh, with us live on live stream, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us this morning. So great to see everyone. Aren't you guys excited tomorrow is spring? All right. Well, we're going to get into our, uh, just a couple of quick announcements I wanted to let you know. We're, we're playing a trip to Haiti. We're really excited about it. And if you're interested in signing up for it, I believe next Saturday is at 6 p.m. here at the church. 6 p.m. here at the church. If you're interested in about the Haiti trip, please let us know. And we're, gonna, we're looking forward to going. It'll be a fantastic trip. That's what will be happening, okay? Let's get right back to what we're talking about. We're talking about hot love. And uh, we're talking about the Song of Solomon. And this, this book of the Bible deals with love relationships. It deals with the context of marriage. It deals with the whole area of human sexuality put in its proper context. And make no mistake about it, you know, you think about all the poems that were written, all the plays that were written, all the stories that were written, all the songs that have been sung over romantic relationships. But the truth is, God designed every relationship, including the marriage relationship between a man and a woman and the intimacy of the process of what brings them together. And so, you know, when you understand that, and you understand that we do have an enemy, I don't know if you realize this, but there's a real devil out there. I don't think he's wasting his time with me, but he's like the president of all evil, and there's different jurisdictions, and their job is to destroy what God has created. And they're very strategic. They understand that if you want to ruin a society, you have to get into the family. And what creates a family, in many ways, one of the things that happens between a husband and a wife, I know not everyone has children, I understand that, but by and large, you have a, a core group, a man and a woman together, and they produce children, they raise a generation, right? And so if you can screw up the family, you screw up the village. If you screw up the village, you screw up the town. If you screw up the town, you screw up the state, the country, the world. So how do you do that? You go after the family. And, and what is the, what, what's the one thing in the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians? It says, he who sins sexually sins against his own body. In other words, it actually does a person greater harm. So as a result of that, the enemy goes after that area because he realizes he can destroy a person and destroy a society. Now let me just quickly stop. Uh, we're not one of those churches that says, stop and no. No, instead we say yes and increase. The way that God has designed it is beautiful, wonderful, and life-giving. The enemy has taken what has been life-giving and twisted it in such a way to bring devastation on society, and this is what we're seeing in our society right now. Let me give you an example of what's happened right now. What's happened is this. I, I don't know if this is true or not, but it makes a good illustration. I heard of the Eskimos. I know it's not politically correct to say that. The people that live in the northern hemisphere that live in igloos, okay, what they used to do is to, 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 to capture a polar bear, they would take a razor spike and they would put herring on it as ice, put blood, herring, ice, blood, herring, ice, and what would happen was a polar bear would smell that at night, come out, and it would begin to lick that spike. As it began to lick the spike, the frozen thing would freeze its tongue, and it would cut its tongue, and the warm blood would get on top of that, begin to melt the ice, and the hair would come out, and the polar bear would, would basically die, losing all its blood. Now, here are the O's, okay? It's not the ones that drink the Coca-Cola. These are, but this is what happens. What happens is it doesn't realize it, but the poison, it, food's a good thing. Keeps a, a bear alive. But what has happened is there's an arsenic, if you will, that's draining its blood. The enemy is draining the blood of our country by twisting sexuality. If you can twist sexuality, you can drain the blood and kill a society. The rise and fall of the Roman Empire from a phenomenal book talks about how Rome disintegrated from inside out, and it was the family that was often destroyed. My friends, the enemy's smart about that. But instead of saying no and stop, we're saying continue and increase in the proper context. That's what this series has all been about. And today, a journey through the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is about a love relationship between a man and a woman. Yes, you can look at it through Christ and his church, but primarily it's about a man and a woman celebrating what God has done. And Solomon has written this and this, he's written 105 of different Psalms and Proverbs, and this is considered his, like, his top stuff. 
And this is Solomon's Song of Songs. More wonderful than any other. Kiss me and kiss me again, for your love is sweeter than wine. How fragrant your cologne. Your name is like spreading of fragrance. No wonder all the young women love you. And what basically she's saying here, and Solomon's saying through this passage of Scripture, is that the relationship is so wonderful and so life-giving that everyone is enamored by her man. And that's how she feels about him. That's how we should feel about our spouse. That they're beautiful and that God's working through them. And it is a celebration. There's this passion that they have all through the book of the Song of Solomon. Now, there's eight chapters, and we've been going through a journey through the Song of Solomon. The first week, we talked about attraction. What makes you attractive? If you're single or married, I encourage you to go back to cornerstonecheshire.com. Incidentally, a little advertisement, you can go, if you have an iPhone, you can go to the App Store and type in Cornerstone Cheshire in the search bar, and up will pop our app. Our app has all the sermons you can give, you can find out news. I encourage you to do that, Cornerstone Cheshire. On your Android devices, look under Google. little advertisement. Now back to our previously scheduled program. Okay, so number one is attraction. Okay, how to be attracted. Then they started dating, and we deal with the right way of dating. Our society has got it all wrong. And then we talk about intimacy. When they got married, then they went to the bedroom, and they celebrated what happened in the bedroom was a wonderful expression of what God has made. It does not need to be shamed about. It's a beautiful thing that God has made. And it doesn't need to be talked about in the locker room or a chat room. It needs to be broadcasted and talk about the proper way in church so we know the right way. Because God is not silent about it. God celebrates what he's created. Then we got into their first fight. All right? You cannot avoid conflict, but you can learn and become better as a result of conflict. Last week, we talked about how to fight. Now, today, we're getting into deepening our relationships. Deepening our relationships. And I, I, I heard a story about a, a couple that was at a church function. And people just were enamored by this couple. They were married for 60 years. I'm like, yeah, man. What's your secret? He says, listen, I, my wife loves to travel. She absolutely loves to travel. So I've taken her all around the world, different places. He says, on our 25th anniversary, I took her to Beijing, China. And we had a incredible time. And, and he said, wow, that, what else did you do? I said, well, on the 50th anniversary, I picked her up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the secret to a relationship. Okay. But a deepening of a relationship, how do you deepen? And now when next week we're looking at the faithfulness. This tomorrow, next week's gonna be the conclusion of it. We're gonna pay a powerful thing. So we're gonna follow love's intentions realized. Love's intentions realized. I don't know about you, but I often judge people what they do. How about you? If someone says they're gonna be a certain place at a certain time, don't show up, they don't care about me. In fact, they, 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 don't, they don't respect my time. If someone takes something that I do and, and blows it off and then take care of something, they don't care about me. And, and as parents, sometimes our children are learning to be responsible and we can judge them based upon what they do. Well, they don't care about me. Or someone in church comes by and say hi to me. <laughs> they think they're too good for me. And what we start judging people by what? By what they do. Do we not do that, everybody? Come on. But there's a problem. You know what we do? In relations, we generally judge others by their actions but ourselves by our intentions. Is that not true, everybody? Come on. Let me give you an example. Imagine this. This would not happen, of course. This is all fictitious. But imagine if Sandra decided she wanted to escape and go out with some friends for a period of time. And let's say she's told me, I'm going to be home at 8 o'clock p.m. And she left me with the children who've been, in, who've been uh, in school all week. It is now Friday night. It's going to be, you know, and they're tired. They play with all their toys. They ate all their snacks. I burned their dinner. Okay? And they're burning their beds. Okay? It's, it's, it's like a prison riot. Okay? It's not going well. And, and Sandra told me she'd be back by 8 o'clock. And I'm just counting the days. And I'm, I'm texting her all through the time. Honey, you need to help me with this. And no response. No response. I bought her a brand new iPhone. No response you know, touch sensitive, the whole thing. Then at 8 o'clock rolls around, still not there. 8.10, not there. 8.20, you know, she doesn't really care. You know, I worked all week, hard, all week. I had a bad week. She knows that I need my sleep. Sundays are coming. 
and I need to have relaxation, and where is she? And then 9.30 comes by. She's an hour and a half late. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. I'm calling her, and it goes right to voicemail. When it goes right to voicemail, you know what that means? It means ring, cancel the call. So she's like, she knows I'm calling, but she's saying, send me the voicemail. Now, I you know I heard people say, go to someplace, but you know, when, I'm, when I'm sent to voicemail, it's like telling me, go to voicemail. <laughs> when you get sent to voicemail, you know, there's problems going on in your life. That's a Christian way of saying it the other way. So she's sending me the voicemail all night long. And then I'm beginning to wonder, oh my God, I got to check the hospitals. Maybe she drove the car off a cliff, even though there's no cliffs around here. I, I, and I start worrying, maybe she died, you know. And now it is, it is 1032, and I hear the garage door. And all of a sudden, my blood pressure goes up. How dare she? She doesn't respect me. She doesn't, she, I've been worried sick. And I go to honey, what happened? And she says, well, well, Hannah dropped my phone in the toilet, and it's ruined. So... This is all fictitious, okay? So, but nevertheless, what would happen? I'm agitated because I think, meanwhile, what she's thinking is like, hey, I, I meant to have been home, and I'm all angry. This would never happen, by the way. This is, this is like Peter Pan. It's fictitious. But there's been other times I'm at the church, for example. I'm, I told my wife, I'll be home at five. But then I see something on, oh, I can't believe this happened in the White House, which is always happening every day. Next thing I know, Rick, Pastor Rick Rocco shows up, and he shows me something. Look at, look at what I got here. I got this brand new phone. I'm looking at the phone, talking about what's going on in his life. And next thing you know, Kevin shows up and talk about him. And then I get a phone call with somebody else, and we go outside. Someone comes with a brand new Corvette and says, Pastor, I'm, I, the Lord's told me you want, he wants me to give this to you. And, and, <laughs> and I start driving around the parking lot, and I'm having a good time. And I'm thinking, oh, my wife won't understand. And, you know, I need to relax a little bit. I need to kind of de decompress, and it's 5 o'clock, it's 6.30. I get home at 7.32, and, and Sandra is, is upset with me. You said you're supposed to be here. The kids are here. What kind of example for it? Our, our dinner time's important to us. Da, 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 da. But honey, you don't understand. I was doing ministry. I was talking to people. That's my job is to talk to people and help people out. And he said, yeah, really? Why do you smell like gasoline and burnt rubber? Anyhow, so anyhow, we go through all that. And what happens is, well, my intentions were to give you a call, but I forgot to because I was distracted. Because I never get distracted. I just want to let you know that. I never get distracted. I'm the most focused person you've ever met in your life. So, but I got distracted. And what I'm doing is I'm judging my actions by my intentions. My intentions is I love my wife, I love my family, but I got a little distracted with a few other things and time ran away with it. So can you see what happens here? It's not fair. We do it all the time. We judge people by their actions and ourselves by our intentions. But there's a saying from 1300 that says, hell is paved with good intentions. Good intentions are not good enough. So how do we like close the gap between intentions and actions? And this is how you deepen love. Real simple today, just the three, three points in a poem and a homily. I'm just kidding. This is what he says now. He's talking to his wife. This is Solomon. How beautiful are your sandaled feet. You know he must be in love to talk about feet. Okay. <laughs> oh, queenly maiden, your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of skilled craftsmen. He's like talking her up. Baby, you're beautiful. You are, you are the cat's dog's bark. Okay. So we want to look at the closing of the gap between intentions and actions. How do we close that gap? Well, one of the ways is this. If you think of something good, say it. How often we don't say the right things. We, we, like, man, I really appreciate what happened today. That's awesome. I really appreciate you know, how Ray led the worship team today, did a great job. Man, I really appreciate it, but I don't tell them. What good is that? You know, and we don't say it often the time, do we? And, and I, I heard a story, and this is a true story, of a person that their spouse died. And it's the funeral, and, and, and I'm talking to them, and they're crying. They're saying, I feel so bad. I never really, I didn't tell her the last day that I loved her. We got in an argument. I never said that I loved her. And, and he's feeling really guilty because he didn't tell her he loved her. What would happen if he would have said, I loved you, when he thought about it? You know what I've learned to do? If I have something good to say, I want to start saying it, especially with the people who you love. Why is it, well, you know, we don't want to patronize someone. We don't want to get them a big ego. Listen, if it's genuine, it's never patronizing. If it's manipulating, that's patronizing. 
If you think of something good, say it. Say it. That's really good. Say it, spray it, whatever you got to do, right? He says, your navel is perfectly formed like a goblet filled with a mixture of wine. What are you doing? <laughs> See what I got to deal with? No, I'm just kidding. Your navel is perfectly formed like a goblet filled with wine. You know, they, in the Old Testament, in, in the Hebrew culture, the stomach was considered the seat of the emotions, and you'd feel, you know how it is. You get butterflies in your stomach, you get nervous. It all happens right here, right? So when he said that your navel is perfectly formed like a goblet filled with mixed wines, like in other words, joy and grace come out of your innermost being. He's saying you're beautiful on the inside as well as the outside. And so, guys, there's a reason why men, when they get a little older, they, they get a bigger midsection. It's because we have all this love. <laughs> all this love and all this grace is stored up. And what happens is you get about 20 extra pounds in there, and this means that you're full of love. Another thing I want to help you guys understand and everyone else is that when you start to lose your hair, it means you have more testosterone, which means you have more manliness inside of you. So if you're bald and overweight, you are godly, okay? <laughs> For everyone that has hair and has a six-pack, you're not. All right, just want to let you know that. So I'm proud of what I've worked on so long. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. Okay, so your goblet is filled with mixed wine. Between your thighs lies a mountain of wheat bordered with lilies. Let's go on. Your breasts are like two thorns. I'm going to put my hands in my pocket because I tend to talk with my hands. And I want to talk about this. I'll keep my hands here, okay? Your breasts are like two fawns of a gazelle. Now, what is he doing? He's speaking powerful words of admiration, affection, and affirmation. How many of you could use more admiration, affection, and affirmation? Is there anyone that's like, man, I just got too much of it. I can't take anymore. I'm tired of winning. Admiration, affection. No, we could all use more of that, right? Because every day we, we, feel like, we feel like we're not good enough. We know we're getting, you know, things happen all the time. We're not good enough. You're not doing enough. We always feel that way. I, I'm not praying enough. I'm not reading the Bible enough. I'm not helping enough. I don't eat enough. Well, that's one thing I don't have a problem with. Uh, you know, so all these things, we struggle with all these things, don't we? We don't feel we're good enough. And so how important is it to do that for each other, especially if it's real? And the Bible says so clearly in Proverbs, this is Solomon again, he says the tongue has the power of life and death. You realize you're made in the image of God. And God spoke and it came into existence. We're made in his image. Now, I'm not one of these people where you just say it and confess, possess people, but there is power in the spoken word. Don't underestimate the power of the tongue. If the enemy can get you to have bad talk, he can get you to be bad. And so the tongue has the power of life and death. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be known as a life-giving person and a life-giving church where we speak life, not death. And so indeed, it says in the book of James, we all make many mistakes. Okay? We all make many mistakes. I hear an amen, everybody. Amen. If you don't make mistakes, this is the wrong church for you. Okay. For if we could control our tongues, we'd be perfect. You want a good relationship, control your tongue. You want a bad relationship, let your tongue do whatever. We'd be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. So talk is extremely important. Your talk would determine your walk. And so one of the things we see is this. It says a small rudder makes a huge ship turn. Whether the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong, it's that small rudder. Your tongue may be a small thing, but it controls the course of your life. The Bible says there's deadly poison in an unbridled tongue. And it also says in Ephesians, let. Let means you have responsibility. That's correct. I can't help myself. Yes, you can. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary... Do you, what does it mean is necessary? It means it's necessary to say good things to each other, which we'll talk about in a few moments. Necessary for edification. That means building up, like building a building, an edification. That it may what? Impart grace. Imparting grace is imparting favor and the ability to do something. So do you realize your words have the ability to build things up and encourage people along the way? Do you realize that? 
Do you realize that our words can change history and you can speak? God is waiting for people to speak. He told the prophet, speak to these dry bones. We need to speak forth the word of God. And sometimes God will give you prophetic words for people. Prophetic words simply, in simple street language, is you hear an impression from God and you share it with somebody else. There are times God will tell you, wow, this person's really good at this. They have a really, I, I've said it before, wow, she's really, she's really organized and she always has a good attitude. My wife goes, did you tell her? No. Tell her. You know, tell somebody, you know, I really appreciate all the work you've done. Thank you for doing this. When you're doing that, you know what you're doing? You're throwing a log on the fire of the gift and the, what they have inside of them. You're stoking a flame. You ever go, you ever meet somebody and you get done, you feel better? You know what they've done? They come in your life, they've thrown some wood of encouragement, and they started a fire, and they prophesied by blowing on that fire, and the flame got greater. What would happen if a husband and wife and children would begin to find what's good instead of what's bad, throw a log of encouragement and blow on it with the power of the Holy Ghost. That means God's spirit on that. Blowing that, what would happen at the fire? I think we become better and greater. But we think you're smarter if you criticize, right? They hire people to be critics. So we think we're smarter if we're critical. Well, what would happen? There's nothing wrong with bringing correction. I'm not one of these people who think everyone gets a trophy. That's silly. I'm not talking about that. But what we're talking about here is building each other up and that's what we're called to do, impart grace to the hearers. So if you think something good, say it. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. This is Solomon again. Do you realize it's better open rebuke than hidden love? If you love somebody or you care about someone, there's something good to say about somebody, say it. Tell them something good. You know, I'm convinced of this. When I was a kid, not too long ago, I, I used to act bad on purpose, so I get punished because I felt like I was being neglected. Mom and Dad, you're watching. You neglected me too much. <laughs> My name is Eric Bucci, and I've been neglected. This is not a 12-step program, okay? But there have been times where I wanted to be punished, so I acted bad on purpose. I did something bad. I felt bad about it, so I said I did something else bad, so I'd be punished. Why? I wanted attention. Negative attention is better than no love. Do you see that, everybody? The Bible says it. Better is open rebuke than, than hidden love. So if you love something and you have something good to say, please say it. We are starving for life. Because the enemy is full of death. The only time he uses compliments is to build your ego to tear you down. Godly compliments will build your ego to worship God and make you stronger. And so that's what we should be doing. When you don't tell them something good, they generally assume something is bad. Like some of you said, Pastor, three years ago, that was a good sermon. You haven't told me in three years. I'm just kidding. I don't need that. Okay, yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the truth. What I really need is my wife to tell me I did a good job. I'm serious. I, I, I'll be honest with you. When she says, eh, she goes, that's what, I mean, and that's, that's what means the world to me, is what she says. But anyhow, when you don't tell them something good, they generally assume something bad. Well, I must not have done a good job today. I must not, you know, I, I screwed up today. I didn't do a good job at work. I didn't do a good job. If you don't tell them something good, they're going to assume something bad. Why? It's just the way it is. We think negative, unfortunately. Our society is negative. So, you know, tell them something good so they don't think something bad. You know, this is the truth. There's a seven-to-one ratio. I read the Harvard Business Review, and there's an article about workplace environment a culture at work. And this is what the article was talking about. It said that, that if you have three compliments or three positive things to one negative, you have a failing work environment. The people will leave and you won't be able to retain your employees unless it's a bad economy and they're going to hold on to their job, but they'll be miserable the whole time. If you have three positives to one negative, that's failing. They, they even said in the article, they said, this is what they said in the article, if you have seven positives to one negative, you're, you're just about above, you're just starting to get above it. And in the article, they talked about, the, the, about marriages and a, a simultaneous, not a simultaneous, but a different parallel study talking about marriages, and they have shown that couples who speak poorly to each other have a higher divorce rate than those that do not. And so what happens is, in a marriage, you want a failing marriage, have three negatives to one positive. You want to have a fair relationship with your kids, and this is the tough part, because we want to help the kids get better. 
And we keep, and it's, it's hard. You, you may have all the right intentions in the world, but our actions of what we say is important. So you need seven to one. It takes at least seven positive statements for every one criticism. Do you realize that? It's, it, it's been scientifically proven and through many studies. So we have to be double. People are longing for good things. Don't patronize. Don't say false. Don't, don't do that. That's, that's evil too. But try to find something good. Well, what about my husband? He's so, he's, he's consistently inconsistent. All right. Tell your husband, honey, you're so consistent. Don't go on. Just say that. Well, thank you, honey. You're consistently inconsistent. But no, you're inconsistent. Begin to celebrate what's good. And when you celebrate what's good, you're throwing the wood in there and you're prophesying on that fire. That fire will grow. That fire will grow. This is a true story. I read it in, in a counseling article a number of years ago about a woman that came to her pastor's office and says, my husband's a jerk. And that's hard to believe, but imagine that. <laughs> and the pastor said, I want you to do something for the next 30 days. I want you to say nothing negative to your husband, and I want you to say good things about your husband. When he comes home, say, honey, thank you for working all day. I really appreciate all the hard work you do. How you come home, you bring a paycheck. Thank you, husband. And, and nothing negative. And say how much you love him. And she did it for 30 days. She came back just, my husband's a changed man. I love him again. And it was all because of what she spoke. My friends, there's power in what you speak. Okay, very, very important that we understand that. And this is what it says in the scriptures. It says Ephesians, and I'm gonna say something controversial. All right, you're gonna be, you're gonna be offended by it, but guess what? I don't care <laughs> because it's the word of God. And we need to be rightly aligned. It says, for the husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave himself his life for her, to make her holy and clean. You know what holy means? Holy means whole and clean. Washed in the cleansing of God's word. Do you realize something, men? I'm going to tell you something here. Men are called to be the leader of the house. That's sexism. No, it's biblical. It's biblical. We're not talking about the value. We have the same value in Christ, but we have different roles. And the man's job is to be Christ. In it. But my husband's not a Christian. I, okay, I get that. Why not try to encourage him in that direction? Husbands, we're supposed to take the lead at the house. We're not supposed to be passive and let our wives do all the spirituality. We should take authority in the area of spiritual leadership because God has placed us as the leader of the house. And leadership does not mean that the woman subservient giving you grapes all day long. No, leadership is this. For the husband, this means love as Christ love. How did Christ love the church? He died for the church. He came to the church when the church wasn't looking for him. That's how husbands are supposed to love their wives. And how do you, how do, you do that? You're washing by the cleansing of God's word. Speak the truth of God. You are a child of the king. You are beautiful. You're made in God's image. You, God has custom made you for me, and I love you. You are the greatest thing that I've ever seen. God knew exactly what I needed, and he gave me you, and I'm so grateful for you. What happens if you start saying that? Now she's back. You start building, cleansing of God's word. Men, speak over your wives. What about the wives? Well, let me tell you another secret I said a couple weeks ago. There's two people you cannot, cannot outgive in this world. And I'll tell you, at least for this in my case, I cannot outgive God. If I'm generous, God always blesses me, much more. I cannot outgive God, and I cannot outgive sin. I pride, I can't. If I'm good to her, she blows it away back. If I give her five bucks, she gives me ten. I wish it was that way with the money, but it's not. But if I give her a compliment, she gives it back. I cannot outgive Sandra. I just can't. And generally speaking, most men, you'll agree with me about not my wife. Okay, we'll pray for you after the service. Okay. Um, all right, cleansing of God's word. He goes back now. Your neck. He's talking to her. It's like an ivory tower. You know, your eyes are like pools. You know, the pools of Heshbron were like as beautiful still water. He's saying, you know what? You are clear from the outside in. You are beautiful on the inside as well. Women are constantly told that your skin has to be tight. You have to staple your skin back like this. You have to, you know, you can't gain any weight. 
You have to look young all your life. Gravity can never take over. Okay, all these things are not true. And, and you know what? The truth of the matter is beauty is inward mostly, mostly. We knew a woman named Helen, and, and Ricardo knows her as well. She's an old woman, 90-something years old. That she had a beautiful eyes and a smile, and she'd say, how you doing, Pastor? And she'd look at me with those eyes, and I mean, she warmed me up. And there's been times where I say, she, she saw how much she loves God, and it would literally bring me almost to the point where I got emotional. <laughs> okay, she was awesome. She was beautiful from the inside out. You focus on that. And so when you tell your spouse, as you get older, you're not going to be perfect, everybody, but on the inside, you can become more beautiful, and you can enjoy the good and begin to talk about what's good. He's saying you're beautiful on the inside as well. Your nose is like a Tower of Lebanon. I don't know about that one, okay, which looks toward (laughs) Damascus. Your head crowns you like Carmel, not the Carmel on your Sunday, but Carmel, Mount Carmel, and your flowing locks are like purple. A king is held captive in the tresses, which is her hair. What does that mean? It means asar. Okay. I'm, trying, I'm, doing, I'm working on my Hebrew. I'm much better at Greek. To yoke or hitch, to bind, to harness a prisoner put in bond. He's saying, baby, you've got me locked up. What would happen if we take all our energy, instead of trying to flirt with someone in the office, or, whoa, look at that, look at her, whoa, how? What would happen if we took that energy and put it back to our spouse? And say, honey, I'm thinking of you. I love you. You're beautiful. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. In and out. What would happen to our relationship? i tell you what would happen to your relationship. You'd spark up that old flame. And that flame would be hotter, brighter, and greater than it ever was before. My friends, that is what God wants us to do. Mutually building each other up. And there's no end to how we can build each other up. Until We become exactly like Christ, it says in Ephesians. Building each other up until you become like Christ. How many folks know we're never to be exactly like Christ? So you can keep building each other up. There's no end to it, my friends. And so how beautiful and pleasant you are, oh, loved one. With all your delights, your stature is like a palm tree. And your breasts are like clusters. (laughs) Talking with my hands. Okay, words steer, steer your relationship and actions move you to where you steer. So you can say all the right things, but you gotta put action into it. Do you see that, everybody? Action is like the accelerator in a car. Steering is your mouth. So steer with your mouth and action accelerate and you'll get to the destination that God has for you. If you think of something good, please say it. If you think of something special, do it. Man, I, I, you know, you drop, I mean, she really appreciates this. I'm going to pick up this for her. I'm going to do this for him. Think about what the person likes and do it. And I will, I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters, or, or may your, excuse me, oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine and the scent of your breath like apples. What did you say? I will climb the palm tree. I was like, what is it? How do you climb a palm tree? I had no idea. So I did a little research. <laughs> And it's interesting. But uh, I did some research about Florida, and there's ways you can climb palm trees in Florida, and apparently it's illegal to take spikes and dig into it, dig into the tree and climb up that way by putting a bunch of punctures in that palm tree to get the fruit at the top. It's illegal. But what you're supposed to do instead is be like a deer stand. If you don't know what that is, it hugs the tree, and you move it up, and it rests on there without damaging the tree. So you get close to the tree, and you climb close to the tree, and you climb, and you show respect to the tree, and so when you get its fruit, it's not destroyed. What would happen if we approached our spouses the same way? You don't give me respect. Or in the bedroom, even the bedroom, for example. It's not all about me. It's about me showing you respect. I don't get any. I don't get any is like taking spikes and climbing up the tree. Instead of being, I want to bless you I want to honor you. You are wonderful. Get close. Get that deer stand close. Get that deer stand. That's how we're supposed to climb the palm tree, everybody. In love, in grace. Society says get some. God's word says give some, and you'll get more than enough. Okay, and that's a, that's a secret. Now, it's not only what you do, but why and how you do it that matters. And he says, and your mouth is like the best wine. 
It goes down smoothly. What is the, why is her mouth so wonderful? What she speaks and how she looks, right? Goes down, my beloved, gliding over her lips and teeth. I am my beloved's and his desire. She's talking about his desire. And the Hebrew word there is an animal consuming one another. That sounds like a lot of fun to me. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> And his desire is for me. It, it really, it's a, it's a strong Hebrew word. He is desiring me. Why? Because all of their affections, you're not spilling your affections on the street, looking at somebody else or clicking on the internet or flirting with someone you found on Facebook from high school. When instead, you're putting all your energy to your spouse the way you should do it and saying, honey, I love you. I'm investing in you. And she invests back in you. Let me tell you, you can have passionate Love relationship. Yes, you don't have to say it the way it used to be. It should be better, and it can be better. God made passionate love relationships. Our marriages should be the best in the world, everybody. And if we do it this way, we won't be wasting ourselves on other things. Why? Because we'll drink deeply of God's love he's given us. Eat, drink, be satisfied, love each other. Don't just spill it out to everyone else. So how do we do that? Purposeful times. Come, my beloved. She said her talking. Let's go out into the field and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early to the vineyards and see whether the vines are budding. In other words, let's go out. Let's let's go on a trip. Let's go on an excursion. Sometimes it's nice to get out of the common thing. I know it's hard. If you have young kids, it's hard, right? To get away. Send them to grandma's house, and don't worry about the wolf. Send them to grandma's house, and, and get out there with your spouse alone. Have alone time, and look across the table with her, and, and be with her in a nice hotel. I mean, I can't afford it. Okay, there's different ways. You can find ways. Believe me. If you can pay $200 a month for cable and satellite television, surely you can take your spouse out. Maybe it's time to cut the satellite. I'm just saying. I mean a metal. Whether the grapes blossom have opened, the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. She's saying, listen, guys, take her out, romancer. You'll get some love. Okay, let me just move on. <laughs> thoughtful acts. What kind of thoughtful acts are that? This is what she says. The mandrakes give off a fragrance. I, I studied about the mandrakes. I took 45 minutes or to an hour studying mandrakes. Uh, what are andrakes? They're, it's an aphrodisiac. It used to be thought that way. Mandrakes are plants. If you pull them out, the roots look like a man. The, the, you know, the, the shape of a man. You know, this kind of man. Okay, okay, very good. Okay. <laughs> the mandrakes give off a fragrance and that our gates are pleasant fruits, all manner, and new and old, which I have laid up for you, my beloved. In other words, I am saving all up my love for you. Isn't that a song? Yes, it is. She's saving up the love and she's got that mandrakes going and you know, it's going to be great. Okay, Sorry. So, if you think something good, say it. If you think something special, do it. And if you want to be something different, be it. Don't wait for her or him to change. You change. That's the best way. You can't change somebody else. Be the change you want to see. I know it sounds like a cliche, but cliches often have truth. That's why they're cliches. And so this is what we need to do. So if you think of something special, do it, everybody. Listen, if, I learned to do this now. If someone drops someone in my mind, I, I'll give them a text or a phone call. Hey, I'm just praying for you. If God drops one of you in my mind, I'll pray for you. Immediately I'll pray. God bless them. And then I'll say, hey, I just prayed for you. And so many times people say, Pastor, how did you know? I don't know. The Lord just put me on my heart, so I prayed. So if there's something good to bless somebody, to be a blessing to somebody, guess what? Do it. Because I believe God is speaking. Do you, let me ask you a question. Do you think the devil wants you to encourage somebody? Of course not. So guess what? If you want to encourage somebody, it's probably the Spirit of God speaking to you. All right. Faith comes out hearing, hearing the word of the Lord. If you want to get more faith, listen to what God tells you. He'll give you more. So if God can entrust you by hearing, bless somebody and say something nice, he'll give you more revelation. Could it be we don't have enough revelation because we don't have enough love? Oh, yes, I do think so. If you're faithful in the small things of doing the little stuff, and God says, bless this person, be nice, be nice to your spouse, do this to your kids, and you listen to that, God will give you more revelation. What's my next career supposed to be? I don't know. The Bible says husbands, I'm, I'm picking on the husbands, your prayers are not answered because you're not treating your wife right. 
What happens when we do things right? Men, let's take responsibility, okay? Don't stop waiting for her, and you start. Someone's got to start, and you're called to be Christ in the relationship. If you want something to different, be it. And then she goes on like this statement. She goes, oh, that you were like my brother who nursed at my mother's breast. And if I should find you outside, I would kiss you. I would not be despised. What's she talking about? Well, back in those days, public display of affection was really frowned upon in the Jewish culture, in particular in a romantic fashion. However, if, my, if your brother or your you know, brother or sister came out, you could give him a hug and a kiss. It would be a- appropriate. She's saying, I just want to show everybody how much I love you. I want to change it up a little bit. And so she was telling the house she just loved him so much. I would lead you and bring you to the, into the house of my mother. She, would, she who used to instruct me, I would cause you to drink of spiced wine, of the juice of my pomegranates. Don't ask me to explain that. Let me move forward. I tell you, God made all this stuff, guys. He made it. It's supposed to be intoxicating. Why do I keep talking about love like wine? Because love is like wine. I wouldn't know, of course, but if I drank wine, I would know. Okay, <laughs> I'm just kidding. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Listen, young people, those who are single or not married, don't be stirring this stuff up until you're married. Why? Because you're diluting the possibility of a greater love when you get married. Save yourself sexually. Save yourself in your love. So when you get married, you have the greatest love-making, love relationship known to anybody. We should be the envy in a positive manner of our relationship should be amazing. God has, guess what? It's God's desire for you to have a passionate love relationship with your spouse. God, what's your will for my life? I'll tell you what God's will for your life is. His, his will is for you to be close to him because he loves you and to love your spouse. That's, it's God's will for you to have a good marriage. So when we, when we avail you of an opportunity once a month and we have a date night here at the church where you have a, a, a seasoned couple that understand like Coleman and Cynthia are going to talk about marriage and they do an amazing job and they encourage you and we give you free babysitting, take advantage of it. Invest in your relationship. And it's the most important thing. So do not stir or awaken love until it pleases. Listen, young people, do not stir this stuff up until it's the right time. Then you can unleash the beauty of what God's created you to be, and it will be so rich and so wonderful. And some of you are saying, but you don't understand. I let it all out already. Okay, I got good news for you. God has come for thus, for, the, for not perfect people. He's come for surrendered people. If you're perfect, God can't help you. Why? Because there's no such thing as a perfect person. But God helps and blesses surrendered people. And if you'll give your past to God, he'll give you his future. And his future can wipe away your past. Your past may be a mile marker, but the pain will be disconnected. God wants to heal you because he loves you. And God wants to heal our relationships. Young people, please do yourself a favor. Save yourself for marriage. If you're living with someone and you're not married, stop having sex and get married and make it right. Oh, how could you say that? Listen, I'm not saying it because you're, I don't want to limit your fun. I want to help your fun. Why? Because God created it that way. When you can do it God's way, you're blessed. Does that make sense, everybody? It's real simple. So let's pray right now. And maybe some of you have struggled in this area. Maybe some of you have made mistakes in the past. I have such good news for you, and this is the good news. For those who are in Christ, the Bible says, they are a new creation. All things are past. It says, behold, all things are new. You may have messed up. It's all right if you surrender it to God. Let God heal it, and he'll make you new in Jesus' name. I'm going to pray right now. I want to pray for marriages right now. And for those of you that are single, you can learn from this by encouraging each other. Maybe your marriage has taken the wrong path. and It's gotten to the point where you're just, you're just roommates. You're just going through the motions and you've lost, that, you've lost the passion for your relationships. And you're just going through the motions. Let me tell you right now, it's God's will for you to have a passionate relationship that's growing. So I'm going to pray for you right now. 
Some of you say, Pastor, please pray for my marriage. Here's every head bowed. Pastor, please pray for my marriage. I need, just real quick, let's be honest here this morning. Say, Pastor, I need help in my marriage. Okay, you're all doing great in your marriages. That's awesome. Well, let's pray anyhow. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that you touch every single marriage here. For those watching online as well. God, we're asking for, Lord, I pray that Cornerstone would be a place of incredible marriages. Father, I pray that marriages would be made strong, they'd be loving, they'd be vibrant, they'd be intoxicating, they'd be, uh, Lord, the effervescence, the, the, the perfume of our relationship would be so beautiful. People would ask us, why is your marriage so amazing? And we could say, because God is in the middle of our relationship. Father, I pray for restoration, I pray for healing, and thank you, Father, that all we have to do is take one step, one step, one step in the right direction over and over and we will get into the destination of your grace in Jesus' name. Now I want to give you another opportunity, everybody. I don't know where you are with God, but you know understand that Jesus loved you so much that he was willing to die for you despite your failing. I don't know anybody in the world that was willing to die for me because of my mistakes. Think about that for a moment. All the mess-ups you've ever had, Christ has died so you can be with him. That's an amazing thing that Christ has done for us. And you know, the Bible says if you confess with your heart and believe, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you will be saved. If you want to give your life to Christ, today can be that day. It's not about knowing about God. It's about surrendering to God. Remember, he's not looking for the perfect. He's looking for the surrendered. Are you surrendered today? Maybe you've fallen away. And you've, you have, you've fallen away from God. Maybe you've never given yourself to God. God is calling you today. If you'd like to pray for a prayer, I'm going to pray for you right now. You want to come in this prayer with me. Just join this prayer with me and pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, all the wrong things I've ever done. Thank you. You're not calling me to be perfect. You call me to be surrendered. And I surrender my life to you today. I declare that you are now in charge and I'm not. I believe you died on the cross and rose again. And because you rose, I could rise out of where I've been. I give my life to you today. Now fill me with your spirit in Jesus' name. Every head bowed. You say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Just real quick, real bold. Put your hand up. You just say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Anyone today? Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Come on. Let's be honest here this morning. Let's be real. I'm being real with you. You be real with me. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay, you can look up, please. And those watching online, you can hit the connection. There's about four or five of you this morning. There's a couple online as well, I believe. And so all you need to do is my decision today I'm committing my life to Christ or I'm renewing my relationship with Christ. God has good things for you. I have come to give you life, an abundant life. Amen, everybody? Well, listen, you fill that out, please. And as we're doing that, we're going to prepare to give in a few moments. That's part of our worship experience is to give back because he's given everything to us. I encourage you to fill that card out as we're getting ready for the ushers to come. I wanted to mention a couple other announcements today. We don't believe in going to church. We believe in being the church. Today, we have a special thing in our growth track. Step three, finding your gifts. Uh, Coleman and Cynthia do an off-the-charts job of getting your personality test. How you fit in a church like this, how can you make a difference with other people? And that's what it's all about. Today, we have a lunch for you and child care, a beautiful meal. We have extra seats. We have extra food. You are invited today. I didn't call ahead. Don't worry about it. We always make extra. You're invited to growth track today on your right-hand side as you walk out of here. Step three. It starts at 12.30 today. Count yourself invited. Okay, everybody? And so let's just go ahead and pray for this offering. Lord, we thank you so much for what you're doing. Lord, we pray you multiply those that give, Lord. Multiply what you're giving. We thank you. It is more blessed to give than receive. We thank you. You'll make, you'll, you will make all of our you will meet all of our needs as we trust you. I just pray you bless everyone right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and do that, um, please, as we do that. And just, a, just another a couple of things, everybody. I want to let you know that um, God has good plans for everyone here. And we're all about that. And every single week we have something called Growth Track. If you have not been growth, through Growth Track, I encourage you to go through it. Every week we have a new one. We have four different classes Step one, how to know God. Step two, how to be connected. Step three, to find your gifts. Step four, and how you make a difference. In fact, the reason why we exist is to know God, to find the freedom he has for us, 
to discover the purpose while we're alive, and then to make a difference in the world together. It's an amazing thing that God's called us to do, and we get to do it together. Isn't that exciting? I think it is. Let's all, let's all stand and we have a closing song. As we're doing that, everybody, I'm going to ask the worship um, prayer team to make their way up. Sometimes you need someone just to come alongside of you and come in agreement. And we just sometimes you need to do that. And so I encourage you, we have the front here open. It's called the altar, the front of the church. And we will, we'll come in agreement with you and pray with you, whatever you need. Let's have that last song as we do that, everybody. Okay, hold it a second. Hold one second. If you need to put my wife on, thank you. Sorry, I, I was a little hesitant to come up, but I really feel in my spirit to say this because even this morning I felt impressed in my heart, but just strongly right now. I feel like I need to say that today there is somebody here that is really close to going to a relationship. You're married, but you are close to being in a relationship that you should not be involved with. And I really feel in my heart to let that person know today just like Joseph, run away from, from the Pharaoh's um, wife. I want to let you know today to whoever is this person, whether it's the person is here or watching, there is time for you to stop this. You reconcile with your wife. Do whatever needs to be done because God will redeem your marriage. There is hope. And if you need help, you come, you call us, you talk to pastor whether it's a, a, a man or a woman but I want to encourage you stop that relationship God is telling you today it's time to run away from that and run towards your wife Amen, let's pray Amen. You know, thank you I want me to pray for that You know, we, we actually believe that God speaks to us uh, we do it humbly we believe he speaks to our inner, inner, inner being and my wife doesn't just make stuff up and I believe what she's saying, what she senses is true. If that's you today, take it serious. Don't, don't miss the opportunity to get off the exit ramp of this relationship before it's too late. You don't want to destroy yourself and everyone else. Take the opportunity, okay, everybody? Listen, we love you. We're, we're human like you are. We need God, you know? We're all, we're all fragile, but we need God. Let's together, let's be beautiful. Let's be beautiful couples. Let's be a beautiful church that makes a difference in this broken world. Can we do that, everybody? God bless you.